Mark Farrell is a member of the Senior Executive Service, and he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for the Environment, Safety, and Infrastructure, Headquarters U.S. Air Force. He provides executive leadership on all matters pertaining to formulation, review, and execution of plans, policies, programs, and budgets for the Air Force built and natural infrastructure, environmental installation, energy, safety, and occupational health programs. These include facility management, military construction, utilities privatization, energy security, and contingency, energy environmental compliance and restoration, occupational safety, and workplace health. With that, I would like to invite Mr. Carell for his opening comments. Mr. Carell. Well, good, thanks, Mark, and good morning to everybody. Thank you again for participating today. We really appreciate you taking time to, to talk with us. Uh, uh, I would like to provide an update today uh, on the Department of the Air Force's response to PFOS and PFOA at the former Ward Smith Air Force Base and to clarify the actions we're taking to protect human health and the environment. You know, we know that the Air Force has a long history with the Escota community and the people of Michigan. In fact, for 70 years, airmen and their families have lived, worked, and called this space, in fact, this community, their home. Fort Smith is part of our heritage and our history. It's part of who the Air Force is and what the Air Force is about. Because of our connection with the community, the Air Force recognizes the role the natural environment plays in Escota's daily life and economy. That's why we're addressing PFOS and PFO at the former Ward Smith Air Force Base, and it is among our highest priorities, and that's why we're here today. Our first priority is protecting human health and the environment. We do that by ensuring that no one on or off our installations, open or closed, our drinking water above the EPA health advisory level attributable to the Air Force, and that's currently true for both the former Ward Smith Air Force Base and the Escota area. When the EPA established a lifetime health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for PFOS and PFOA and drinking water, the Air Force evaluated 203 installations, identified 190 for further actions, took immediate action to protect human health at 33 locations, and is moving forward to address groundwater at 189 installations. Wordsmith was among the first. Dr. Steve Termath and his team are leading a response at Wordsmith and can give you more details, but I want to point out a few of the actions the Air Force has taken here so far. In April of 2015, before we knew anything, if, or before we knew if any of the drinking water supplies were impacted by PFOS and PFOA, the Air Force Civil Engineer Center installed a granulated activated carbon pump and treat system at the former fire training area to prevent further migration of PFOS and PFOA into Clark's Marsh and to the Osama River. This was one of the first systems the Air Force installed in our nationwide response to PFOS and PFOA. Between December of 2015 and May of 2016, Dr. Termath's team sampled 54 private drinking water wells and two public wells. We identified one private residence with PFOS and PFOA above the EPA health advisory, immediately provided bottled water, and have subsequently connected the residents to the public water system. In 2018 and 2019, the Air Force began operation of additional treatment to remove PFOS and PFOA from three existing systems that were originally designed to remove solvents from contaminated groundwater. We're also conducting remedial investigation, which is providing the data we need to design and install treatment systems to control PFOS and PFOA migration into sensitive areas like Clark's Marsh and Bennett and Lake, and then to assess possible cleanup actions for the remainder of the groundwater. Because of these actions, we're confident the drinking water supplies around the former Ward Smith Air Force Base meet the EPA's advisory. Now, the Air Force's environmental cleanup response is based on risk to human health and the environment, and we follow the federal CERCLA process. CERCLA is the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act and is the federal framework in place for responding to the release of potentially hazardous material in the environment. Let me take a moment, moment to explain what I mean when I say risk. We approach an environmental response much like a medical professional approaches a patient. CERCLA is our process for evaluating the issue. 
our first step is to determine if there is an immediate risk to human health. To do that, we rely on regulators who establish standards for us to follow. For PFOS and PFOA, drinking water is the most immediate pathway to human consumption, and the EPA Health Advisory gives us a baseline risk level to work with while we're following the CERCLA process. Now, CERCLA is a complicated process, and it takes time. It's a methodical, science-driven approach that leads to the most effective long-term actions to protect human health and the environment. Now, I know some people are concerned that we're not taking action, but it's important to get the cleanup right. When it comes to protecting human health, we don't have the luxury of picking speed over quality. Once we assure the connection between impacted drinking water and people is taken care of, we focus on the action that will best protect the community. Let me assure you, we are taking action. Under CERCLA, we identify, if we identify a risk to human health or the environment, we can and have taken action. We're not sitting still. One reason we've made great progress at Worsmith is the support we get from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, or EGLE. They are the regulators, and we are the regulated. They are, they are the community's representatives in the environmental response process, and we work together to protect this community. With their support, we've taken care of the drinking water and are now focused on the groundwater. EGLE and the Air Force both work from promulgated standards. As you may know, PFOS and PFOA are not regulated at the federal level, but the state of Michigan has developed groundwater cleanup criteria for PFOS, PFOA, and five other PFAS. And the Air Force will consider those criteria as potential cleanup standards when we select final remedies for the various Wordsmith sites. In the meantime, the treatment systems we are using to treat water going into Clark's Marsh is it engineered to intercept and clean PFOS and PFOA. Since 2015, the system has treated more than 500 million gallons of groundwater, and monitoring has consistently shown that PFOS and PFOA at both are both at levels so small as to be considered non-detected. As I said, we understand and share the community's concerns, the need for information, and the need to be heard. The Escota community and its representatives are intent on ensuring the Air Force considers their inputs as we take action. We welcome their input. The CERCLA process offers many opportunities to participate in restoration efforts, and the Air Force has provided several channels for public voices to be heard. These include a quarterly restoration advisory board to provide information about PFOS and PFOA response and other restoration activities at the installation, a web page about the Air Force response to PFOS and PFOA and all other contaminants, both across the nation and here at Wordsmith. An information repository about the Wordsmith response actions at the Robert J. Parks Public Library in Escoda. Assistant Secretary of the Air Force and other leaders traveling to Escoda and meeting with community officials and citizens in public forums. In keeping with the CERCLA process, opening planned actions for public input such as the ongoing public comment period for the proposed interim remedial action associated with Clark's Marsh. We also meet with congressional delegations, other elected officials who represent the public interest, and of course today, engage media as a conduit for information on our response. Now, as I've noted, PFAS and PFOA issue at Wordsmith is one of the highest environmental response priorities for the Air Force, but the Air Force is following all environmental cleanup laws. It's taking an aggressive approach to PFAS remedial activities and continues to collaborate with Michigan and the city of Muscoda concerning PFAS and PFOA related issues. We've moved quickly to respond where we can and we've implemented measures that protect drinking water supplies. The Air Force recognizes the Muscoda community and the state of Michigan are concerned about more than drinking water. We share those concerns and know we have a part in the solution, but the Air Force can't do it alone. Resolving PFAS and PFOA issues at Wordsmith and across the nation require a whole of government response. We have the experts to address technical challenges of environmental restoration, but we look to our federal partners for the studies, research, standards, and guidance we need to do more. We use the laws, authority, and funding Congress provides to take action, and we rely and collaborate with our regulatory partners to ensure we're meeting appropriate requirements. The Air Force also relies on the Escoda community. To put it in Air Force terms, we are each other's wingmen in this response, and we must continue to work together 
to bring this issue to a successful close. You are vocal, active, and engaged, and I thank you for your commitment to protecting and preserving your way of life. We may not always agree on the path forward, but I want to assure you we are always moving forward, and we're doing it with you and your interests in mind. I'd like to thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Steve Termath, who will provide an update on the response effort at Ward Smith. Steve? Thank you, Mr. Correll. I'm Steve Termath, and I'm Chief of the uh, Base Realignment Closure uh, Program Management uh, for 40 locations across the country. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide more details about specific actions the Air Force has taken and our plans for addressing the PFAS and PFAR releases that occurred from past uses of firefighting foam at the former Worsenet Air Force Base. Under the CIRCLE process, the Air Force has taken actions to protect drinking water. During the first phase of the CIRCLE process to identify releases of PFOS and PFOA, during a site inspection, we sampled 54 drinking water wells and two trailer park wells that are considered public supplies. Only one of these private wells showed PFOS or PFOA levels above the EPA Lifetime Health Advisory. This one well out of the 54 was connected to the municipal water supply with Air Force funding. From 2016 to 2020, we monitored all drinking water wells that contained measurable amounts of PFOS, P4. There was no appreciable increase in concentration in any of these wells. The Air Force has not evaluated impacts to drinking water wells on the east side of Van Etten Lake because separate U.S. Geologic Survey Air Force and Eagle evaluations did not find evidence of groundwater flow from Wurtsmith to the east side of the lake. The Air Force is now conducting the remedial investigation phase of CERCLA to delineate the groundwater plumes resulting from releases and conduct risk assessments and identify the areas for cleanup. The remedial investigation provides the detailed information on the definition of plume boundaries needed to identify appropriate treatment technologies and ultimately design remedial actions. Finding the concentration contours is an ongoing process that examines monitoring well data. To speed this process, the Air Force is using an on-site laboratory. This allows decisions in the field on, on where additional sampling may be needed to define the plume. PFOS and PFOA. Throughout the CIRCLE process, the Air Force is keeping the public informed in our plans, objectives, and course of actions. The Restoration Advisory Board was formed to serve as a critical interface with the public during the CIRCLE process. With public members and township, forest service, and regulatory agencies representatives, the board meets quarterly to review and advise on Air Force progress, the Restoration Advisory Board has an important role to provide comments on Air Force remediation plans and objectives, and its quarterly meetings are open to the public. The public is also given the opportunity to speak and ask questions during these meetings. In addition, the general public and the Restoration Advisory Board have the important role of reviewing and commenting on the Air Force's published proposed plans which explain what remedial action the Air Force proposes to take. For example, the alternatives for expansion of the intermedial action at Clark's Marsh is open for public comment through April 17th. Responses to public comment on the proposed remedial action are provided as part of the decision document. We will talk more about the details of this interim action in just a moment. In addition to the board, there are also other sources of public information on websites, including an administrative record with documents pertaining to the cleanup at the former Wordsmith Air Force Base. The Air Force has several ongoing response actions at Wordsmith. Our first action taken was related to operations associated with a firefighting training area near Clark's Marsh. The Air Force installed wells to intercept PFOS and PFOA in groundwater prior to it reaching the marsh. The extracted groundwater is treated using granule-activated carbon and then 
re-injected back into the groundwater. The treatment system has been in operation since June 2015 and has treated water injected into the groundwater contains essentially non-detectable levels of PFOS and PFOA. In the area influenced by the treatment system, 90% of the PFOS and PFOA has been removed from the groundwater. In other areas on Wordsmith, there are, there are three treatment systems that were originally installed to remove solvents. We later learned that these systems were found to have PFOS and PFOA in the discharges. The Air Force added treatment to remove PFOS and PFOA to two of the systems in 2018, and a third was added in 2019. The treated water with essentially non-detectable levels of PFOS and PFOA is discharged in Manhattan Creek and the All Sable River, respectively. The treatment technologies used in all the interim actions successfully achieved levels of PFOS and PFOA in the discharge well below state requirements. In total, the Air Force has treated 1 billion gallons of water. To put this in context, a billion gallons would fill a 100-acre lake to a depth of three stories. The Air Force is designing two interremedial actions this year, and operation of these begin next year. First, the treatment system at Clark's Marsh is being expanded to capture additional groundwater for removal and treatment of PFOS and PFOA. The proposed plan is currently undergoing public comment before a decision is made on the design and treatment selection. A second interim remedial action is being designed to intercept a PFOS and PFOA plume before reaching Van Etten Lake near the area of Ratcliffe Park, Ratliff Park. A proposed plan for the interim remedial action should be released in the next few months for public comment. The Air Force will continue to work with Eagle to identify other potential interremedial actions during the remedial investigation. To date, the Air Force has spent $27.7 million at Wordsmith to address PFOS and PFOA. That total includes $13.5 million for the investigation and the two interim remedial actions in planning. An estimate for future costs to address PFOS and PFOA efforts is $250 million. I want to thank you, and that concludes my uh, summary of Air Force actions. Thank you, Dr. Termap. Now we will open it up for questions, and I see that the first question is... Jordan Hermani with Gondwar News Service, the Michigan Report. Uh, Jordan, what's your question? Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I believe it was Mr. Corral who said that the U.S. Air Force would consider uh, Michigan. I'm sorry, would consider Michigan stricter than federal PFAS groundwater cleanup standards um, when attempting to remediate the Wordsmith site. However, recently, I believe last month, our governor did evoke Section 332 of the uh, 20, uh, yeah, 2020 NDAA, um, asking for the Air Force to commit to respecting Michigan stricter than federal levels. Um, is the Air Force in a position to commit to Michigan's cleanup standards, and, and what is being weighed in deciding that? Yeah, thanks, Jordan. I appreciate that. And, and, and of course, you know, we share the, the community's interest and concern in meeting state standards as well as federal standards. Uh, with this particular request, the Air Force has been made aware of the letter that, uh, that Governor Whitmer sent, but she sent that directly to the Secretary of Defense. And, and although that letter does cite a former Air Force base, obviously, Wordsmith, um, it, her request has much broader implications to the entire program. And so at this point, what I can tell you is uh, that we're going to plan to work closely with uh, Secretary Austin and his staff to determine what his response is going to be because the letter went to him. All right. Uh, next question is Garrett Ellison. Garrett, could you please give us your uh, your uh, media affiliation? Yeah, uh, this is Garrett Ellison with M Live. Go ahead. Um, you know, this I think this is a question for Mr. Carell. Um, so, 
I've heard several times that the uh, treatment system will essentially achieve non-detectable uh, levels and um, more or less essentially exceed the state's standards. So if that is the case, why will the Air Force simply not commit to meeting those standards formally? I mean, if you're already planning to do that, isn't it a bit ridiculous to go through this whole rigmarole and debate over when the standards will be met and, and so forth if you say this treatment system is being designed to meet them anyway? So I don't understand that. Oh, thanks, Garrett. I appreciate that. And uh, and so we uh, so one of the focuses we have is is we have authorities under the under circlet to take action. It is a, a good news story for everyone that the treatment that we use does, in fact, achieve typically non detect levels. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that we have the authority to go design a system to do that. And so I think what I would clarify is we don't design the system to get to non detect. What happens is when you use granulated activated carbon or some of the other uh, types of, of processes we have, that's the, that's the result we achieve. And so to some extent, it becomes a more academic discussion about about what the what the levels are, because the result you're going to get is a good one. Now, if it wasn't, then it would be a much more difficult discussion. But to be clear, we don't design the system to get to non detect, it gives us non detect. And that's good news. What we do have are the authorities under CERCLA that allow us to go address groundwater, even though there are no promulgated standards for it at this point in time. I'm sorry, you, just to clarify, you say you don't have the authority to meet the state's standards, but you're going to do that anyway. So there are a number of different things that 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 come into play with regard to uh, federal law and state law. So for example, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there is specific requirements that if we are a producer of water, uh, like a water utility, and we don't have this situation in Michigan, but we do in other, other places in the United States, then we meet the federal and state standards. CERCLA doesn't provide that. CERCLA provides us the opportunity for those constituents, whether they're contaminants, pollutants, or if they're actually hazardous materials, uh, if there is some way that EPA has come out and allowed us to take action, we can do that. With PFAS and PFOA, the Lifetime Health Advisory allows us to consider under Section 104 of CERCLA this to be an other pollutant and take some action. And, that's, and that trigger is the Lifetime Health Advisory that allows us to move forward. When we do that, we then install the technology that's most appropriate and it gets us to non-detect. The action level is 70 because of the EPA health advisory. The result is non-detect because that's what the technology gives us. Okay. Uh, next question is Suzanne Johannes. Suzanne, what is your uh, media affiliation, please? Um, sure. Um, I'm with Inside EPA. Uh, Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, I guess two questions. So kind of to follow up on the last question, are you basically saying um, you don't want to follow, like, I'm trying to understand, I mean, the, the state standards are supposed to be ARARs in my understanding, so won't you have to follow those? Um, and secondly, um, won't you have to revisit the cleanup here um, if EPA names at least these two substances as super fun hazardous substances? So I'm just wondering about those two questions. Okay, sure. Let me follow up on that. So thanks for asking that because I, I kind of focused on the, the in, in responding a minute ago, I focused more on the uh, what's the level of what's going to come out of this when it's all said and done. So you are absolutely right. If the state properly promulgates its own more stringent standard, then it will be considered as an ARAR when we get to the final remedy phase. So when we get the final remedy and we're looking at here's what we're going to do to address the source areas and all others, we will con consider the, the state standards, assuming they're more stringent, which they are, as ARARs. And while at this point I can't guarantee, yes, that's what's going to be selected, um, if you look at the history, then in general, more stringent standards tend to uh, be the ones that are selected. So yes, it will be considered, but it doesn't it doesn't 
become an action level. It does become something we would consider as an ARR for the groundwater cleanup that we give to the remedy. With regard to Superfund, um, I, I think what I what I say, and Michigan is, is probably one of the most aware states in the union of this, that it's not just the Department of Defense. There are a number of sources of PFAS in the water, um, and you've seen it at Parchment, you've seen it at uh, Wolverine and a number of other locations. Uh, but what happens with the Department of Defense is we have CERCLA. And so CERCLA requires us to take action based on what we've done so far already. So I, I guess what I would say is, even if EPA designates this as a hazardous uh, material uh, or and or it's included in Superfund, we're already doing that under CERCLA. And so I don't know that there will be much different going forward. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, looks like we have a follow-up from Gary. Hi, thank you. Um, so I have a, a two-parter here. Um, so I'd like to know what the Air Force has done and is doing uh, for homes in the Escoda area that have elevated PFAS detections for chemicals other than the individual compounds PFOS and PFOA. It's my understanding that there are numerous varieties of these chemicals that have been found in drinking water uh, systems at detection levels above 70 parts per trillion. Second part of that is drinking water is not the only relevant exposure pathway in this situation. What is the Air Force doing in Oscoda to keep people from eating contaminated fish and contaminated wildlife near the base. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. I appreciate that. So, um, one of the things I commented on earlier, and, and it gives me a good chance to expand a little bit, is this this notion of a whole of government approach to dealing with um, these issues across the nation. So, the, the Department of Defense is extraordinarily good at defending this country and the Constitution uh, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's our core competency. Uh, we rely on other government agencies to help us out in the other areas where we're trying to be good environmental stewards of the land that we are sharing with your state. So what does that mean? That means we rely on the Environmental Protection Agency to tell us when and what and to some extent how we should go about addressing different chemicals that are in the environment. So one of the things I'll give you just as an anecdote, there are approximately 80,000 registered chemicals in the United States. And the EPA has issued regulatory guidance or health advisories on a little over 225 of those. So what does that mean for the other 79,000 plus? It means, like everyone else in the United States, the Department of Defense uses the material safety data sheets that come from the manufacturers as the best information we have until the Environmental Protection Agency identifies those other chemicals as things we need to go take a look at. To date, with regard to PFAS, the, the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has sent us a health advisory on PFOS and PFOA, but not on those other chemicals. And so at this point in time, we don't have any guidance from the EPA, nor do we have any authority under CERCLA to go address those. Now, if at some point the EPA decides it wants to put that information out, uh, then we could do something along those lines. Very similar on the other pathways. There are multiple pathways of exposure to any and all contaminants that could be in the environment. Um, and so we have to rely on, but, but again, there's no guidance on what makes sense. So from the USDA, from the FDA, from the Department of Agriculture, we would rely on them to tell us what should we be doing with regard to flora and fauna and agriculture, because we don't have any of that guidance within the Department of Defense. We are engaged with them at the OSD level to help us understand. And in the meantime, the best advice that, that, that we could do is to tell the folks in Michigan to look to what the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has said. But from a federal standpoint, uh, there is no guidance that comes out. Does that help? Um, I, I guess. So I, make sure I clarify what you said there uh, uh, in response to the first part of my question. Did you say that the Air or the Department of Defense, instead of uh, relying on promulgated standards that the state would uh, create for other compounds besides PFOS and PFOA, such as PFHXS and PFNA and, and Gen X and some of these other I mean, ones that we've all heard of, 
instead of relying on that, you rely on MSDS sheets from the manufacturers. It, it, it seems like I, I'm trying to understand that there's there, there's other relevant and credible health guidance on other compounds besides what the EPA has developed, and I'm not understanding why EPA guidance would be, if you don't have that, you have to rely on MSDS sheets from the manufacturers. That seems to ignore the fact that there's lots of credible research and promulgated standards out there from states getting at the idea of, you know, safety thresholds for other compounds. So that, I think that's a fair point. Um, I'm going to take that one for the record and get back to you because that's one I need to run through the Office of Secretary of Defense and the lawyers to say, okay, so how do we, when, when there is no problem, there's nothing from, from the EPA, uh, but there are state standards, how do we handle those besides what the manufacturer safety data sheet says? So that's one I'd like to take for the record because I'm not sure I can speak authoritatively to you on it, but it's a fair point. We'll get that back to you, Garrett. All right, thank you. I'd Thank like you. to comment on that one. So Michigan is still in the rulemaking process for the promulgating of the compounds that you just mentioned, those five different compounds. With that, we are looking at those compounds as we approach the RI and as we start evaluating potential errors. So we are not just not considering them. We are considering them. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Marley, are you sure about that, that the state of Michigan is still in the rulemaking process for those other compounds? Because my understanding that, uh, at least in terms of the MCLs, uh, which this stuff is based on, those were enacted formally last year. And then there, in terms of the groundwater cleanup criteria, is, is, is that what you're just talking about? Could you clarify that? Correct. I'm talking about groundwater cleanup criteria. The groundwater cleanup criteria for the five compounds that you mentioned are still in the rulemaking process. They have not been promulgated by the state. And, okay, so that's, well, they, once they're promulgated, what does the Air Force then do and how does it apply them as towards them? So we are working through the rulemaking. We are working through the RI right now. We are going to delineate to those for those compounds. We are going to evaluate those as we start getting into the feasibility study. Then as we move on to the proposed plan, they will be considered as errors. And that's where our lawyers determine what is applicable and what we can do. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jordan, I see you have your hand up again. Jordan Armani. Yes, thank you. I wanted to follow up briefly on my first question. Um, when it was said that because Governor Whitmer sent the letter to Secretary Austin instead of the Air Force properly, I mean, so if she had sent it to someone within USAF or, or, or someone within the department that deals with this whole remediation effort, are you saying that like maybe we would have a more expedited answer on whether or not the Air Force would comply or commit to complying with Michigan stricter than federal cleanup standards? Yeah, thanks, Jordan. So the answer to that question is no. So the governor made the smart move by sending it directly to the Secretary of Defense. Um, had she sent it to the Secretary of the Air Force, the acting Secretary of the Air Force, um, we would have sent it to the Office of Secretary of Defense. And the reason for that is PFO and PFAS are not Air Force unique. The Army, the Navy, the Department, the, the Defense uh, Logistics Agency, and our National Guard all are impacted by what, what the PFAS P4 regulations are across the nation. So, in order to maintain a consistent, I'm uh, sorry about that, um, in order to maintain a consistent response and to do things that, you know, what we don't want is a situation where the Air Force is doing something in Michigan, the Army is doing something different in Michigan, and nobody can understand why they're different. We would have sent this to the Office of Secretary of Defense and said, hey, this has broad implications. How do you want us to proceed? Okay, and then perhaps changing the topic slightly for a moment. Um, there has been a little bit of an outcry from the Oscoda, Oscoda area, uh, specifically like the Oscoda Township, Superintendent, I know I spoke with a number of environmental groups who say that the Air Force, um, specific to, I believe, you 
they said the Clark's Marsh raft cleanup um, plan, that the Air Force hasn't really been forthcoming in sharing with local units what it is doing. I mean, is that a breakdown between Eagle and local units, or, or can you just help me understand, I guess, why that seems to be an issue that Oscoda area residents and, and groups are saying is a is an issue. Sure, thanks. So, so I appreciate that. And you know, we are focused on collaborating and communicating appropriately with all of the stakeholders that are out there. But there, there are some things where that make a lot of sense, and some things that that maybe it's it, it isn't the right time to collaborate and communicate. So, what do I mean by that? I mentioned earlier in my remarks that that we are the regulated entity and the regulator is eagle and eagle is the representative of the community and so as we're working to actually decide what we think the best best plan is going forward that's an appropriate discussion between the regulated and the regulator now that doesn't mean we don't want all those other inputs that come in from the community and others and so for example in this public comment period now for clark's marsh we haven't decided what we're going to do we are in fact opening it up so that the public can comment and provide us input on that they're not just providing input to the united states air force they're also providing input to eagle when they do that and so that is who we look to to represent those inputs from those folks is through eagle as we talk with them as our regulator does that help yes i believe that the issue specific to that draft plan was that there was no from what I had understood from Oscoda groups, there was no input from them in crafting that draft plan. They understand that the public comment is open now and that they can comment from there. But from my understanding, um, I know a local group told me that they had been blindsided by the fact that the plan was being dropped and that they found out about it from media groups asking them, what is your reaction to the Air Force's draft plan? Hey, Jordan, I'll comment on that. So we communicated what we plan to do when we awarded the contract and for the RI and for the IRAs. Then we communicated again regularly at, for, at RAPS and at RAC community meetings what our plans were and what we were thinking, what our schedule was. And there has been conversations between local community, us, Forest Service, Eagle, all along the way. So I'm still trying to understand why they feel like they've been blindsided when we're trying to move fast, we're communicating what we're doing and we're doing the best we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Garrett, uh, you have another follow-up. Uh, thanks. Um, just a quick note there, uh, Dr. Varley, I, uh, you know, I noticed that in the list of entities you were saying were being communicated with, you didn't include local officials like sort of Osable Township or Oscoda Township. And I think to Jordan's point of her question, those are the entities that are upset that they're not being communicated with. So that's just a you know, um, sort of a. This is Steve Turk. Yes, sir. I understand your question. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, the point that we're trying to make is that we have, we believe we have been very transparent about the objectives that we have, for example, the Clark's Marsh treatment system on there. We closely followed and provided those objectives to it. And I think uh, we do have some very talented people that are on the Restoration Advisory Board that feel like they should have been more engaged in the actual technology discussions and selections on that. But I think the important thing is we continue to tell what we're planning to do, what our objectives are for all that, and then when we have something like the proposed plan for how we're going to go into Clark's Marsh, we give that out. We've worked it with this, with Eagle. That's all been coordinated with them. They've had input on that proposed plan, and then we go for the public comment and, and get that. It has to do with, uh, you know, concern that they're not inputting at every step of the development of a technical report or technical thing. And, and um, that's not, as Mr. Correll pointed out, that we do work with Eagle, we work with them, and the regulator, regulatory, uh, uh, is an important relationship before we uh, do a lot of that other. So that's our, our view on the uh, 
communications anyway. Um, thanks, Dr. Termath, uh, for, for jumping in there. Actually, the, the, that was sort of a continuation of Jordan's question, but the question I have, I think, is something is one that I think you're probably best uh, suited to answer. Um, it's sort of, it, it's not exactly related to the interim cleanup, but it is related to the situation at the base. And I was wondering if you could help me understand, you know, what evidence uh, that the Air Force has to suggest that it does not bear responsibility for cleanup uh, at satellite locations around the base, such as the Oscoda Schools Complex, the Colbath Road neighborhood, uh, places like that, where, from my understanding and from the understanding of local officials, it was AFFF from the base that was used to fight fires under a mutual aid response, and that's what caused the contamination. So it's foam that's from the base that's caused contamination at other locations around Oscoda, However, the Air Force will not res take responsibility for those uh, situations, and it ends up forcing the locals to bear the cost of, you know, uh, providing safe uh, drinking water. So, does the Air Force have evidence to back up its assertion that it doesn't have responsibility? It, in terms of the responsibility. Uh, and thank you for that follow-on question. But in terms of responsibility, when we have those mutual agreements with the community, normally included in that is the fact that we are responding on their behalf and in a way that they approved and wanted, and it was not a direct Air Force action. And so, therefore, that's why the Air Force uh, is looks at it in that way. And in one of those situations, after the installation closed, and the community did use uh, AFFF to respond to a fire incident. Uh, and, but that was a decision by the community to use that AFFF. So we got there's several circumstances that have to be looked at whenever we do that. But, uh, we certainly do take responsibility that are, are directly uh, related to Air Force activities and Air Force uh, releases with their mission activities, as opposed to uh, mutual aid support when a community asks us to come in and use AFFF to put out a fire. Even when the community wouldn't know at the time, presumably, that there was a, you know, they don't have the opportunity to go, well, hey, maybe won't, we won't call the Air Force uh, because they're going to come with this stuff that poisons the groundwater afterwards, right? It doesn't sound like there was, you know, if these responses took place in the past before anybody understood that, whose responsibility is it except for the provider of the stuff that contaminated the, uh, the groundwater? So Garrett, Mark Carell, so, you know, we, we can come back to you with a, with a legal opinion on this. What, what I can echo is what Steve said. So on active duty, I was a fire marshal on two occasions. I've overseen mutual aid agreements on multiple occasions. When we respond off base, we, were, we respond under the command of the local fire chief. So that means the local fire chief decides what he wants done. Um, and in much the same way, I think the Air Force would say, in much the same way that we used AFFF not knowing that it was a problem and now take responsibility for the fact that we put it down, then then, then that responsibility is going to lie off base. Now, I don't know that that's the official legal position, but I'm happy to go see what our lawyers say about it. But in general, Steve's right. When we go off base, we're under the authority of the local. We do what they ask us to do. And I think it's important to note that if we get into a situation where, where we have to worry every time that something we're doing today might come back to haunt us later, that will diminish our ability to mutually aid one another. So I think there's a level of risk, at least in mutual aid responses, that both the community and the Air Force have to accept. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. And Garrett, if you'll do me a favor, we owe you a couple of follow-ups. If you would be kind enough to shoot those to me, uh, email. I think you have my email address, just to make sure I have the precise question that you'd like us to follow up on. I have notes here. That way we at least have uh, a trail that uh, I can follow back with you on. And I'll get that answer for you as soon as possible. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, looking at our uh, board, are there any other questions? I don't see any other hands, and I don't have any Q&As teed up. Uh, 
Yes, Suzanne. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, yeah, this is kind of a broader question, but um, the Biden administration, um, you know, before they before Biden was elected in his EJ platform, he um, specifically talked about um, taking action on, on PFAS and, and gave a couple specifics. So I wondered, is have, have you been with the new administration in place? Have you been given any new direction? on PFAS in terms of addressing it or policy, either, you know, I, I guess I'm more asking, you know, throughout the Air Force, not just at Wardsmith. So Mark, uh, I, I say not yet. Uh, we have seen significant input that I think it, where this might get rolled in is under under the climate and energy aspects. So there is a significant um, environmental justice movement where, in fact, each of the services now there's a there is a, a task force at the DoD level and, is, and each of the services is participating as well in environmental justice under the climate aspects. We have not seen a specific discussion that says, okay, here's what's going to change um, on. PFAS in general or EJ associated with PFAS from the administration yet uh, that could come, uh, but that's all we've seen so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Garrett, your hand is up. Uh, thanks. Last question, I promise. Um, I, I was hoping, um, Mr. Carell, that you could perhaps respond to uh, Congressman Dan Kildee's assertion from uh, a couple of months ago that the uh, entire Department of, of Defense uh, essentially needs a culture change and uh, how it uh, views and addresses pollution concerns uh, specific to PFAS. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know if you, you saw that or not, uh, but that was a, a specific term that he used, culture change. Um, so I was wondering if you could respond to that. So, so thanks. I, I obviously I, I've met with Rep. Kildee, um, visited the base with with Rep. Kildee, and so I, I, I'm not going to to dispute his position. Um, I, I believe the Department of Defense has a proactive and aggressive uh, response to PFOS and PFOA. Um, I believe we're doing the right things, but of course, Congress is, gives us guidance in these areas. And so I'm not going to dispute what Rep. Kildee says. I'm going to say from our perspective, we at least we believe um, we are doing, we're taking an aggressive and a proactive approach. All right. Thank you. We have a question in the Q&A from Steve Carmody with Michigan Radio. His question is, what is the timetable for the final remedy decision where state standards may be considered? Is that months, years, decades? Well, under the circle process, we'll be completing the remedial investigation, and right now our target for that completion is two years from now. Once we have that information, we do go into something called a feasibility study, where we look at the various technologies that are available to address the remedial action, the um, remediation needs that have been identified in the remedial investigation. And then we make that decision. I know I'm hedging a little bit on that, but frequently that last part is a year or two to get those decisions out and, and made. And again, there's a lot of parameters that will affect that, um, you know, depending upon, uh, you know, what we find in the groundwater and other things that can impact all that decision process and how we go about it. So this Mark Russell, in general, the circle of process to get to a, re a record of decision is an eight to 12 year process. And there are a lot of reasons for that. So for example, in the remedial investigation phase where we are right now, we have to define the length, width, depth, and constituents of the plume. We don't do that unilaterally. So that will be done in conjunction with Eagle. And so there may be an extent, we may say, okay, we think we've, we've dropped all the wells we need to to define the plume. Eagle says, no, we think we need some more. That can take an extended period of time to come to an agreement on what exactly is the problem. And that's what the remedial investigation will conclude. Then we move to feasibility study of what are we going to do? Again, in conjunction with the regulators, here's what we think the appropriate response is. This is where we think we need to do those responses. Do you agree with that? Once we come to an agreement, that's typically another year or two, as, as Dr. Terman said. Then we sign the record of agreement, then we install the systems and operate them uh, and monitor to see how they go. So your, your fundamental question was, is this months or years? The answer is years. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll see if we have any more. I'll hold for a moment. OK. 
Okay, seeing no other hands and no other comments. Hey, Mark, let me just add one thing to my last thing. So I said it's years. I, I would also emphasize during that time frame, no one's drinking water above the health advisory level. We continue to do to make sure no one's drinking the water. And as you see at Clark's Marth and Vanette and Lake, if we find along the way, before we get to the actual feasibility study and final solution, we find things we can do in the interim that are going to be helpful, then we'll do those. And you're seeing two of those that are about to occur at Clark's March and Manhattan Lake as well. And, Thank uh, you, sir. Oh, and sir if I ahead. may add, if that's okay, the, Mr. Carell talked about the time frames that we have on there. And I want to point out when you talk about culture and everything, it, it was the Assistant Secretary and Mr. Carell that have talked to us about what is it that we can do to do the uh, RI process and other things in an expedited or uh, careful manner. And we're doing that at Wordsmith. And the important thing on there is that as we work through these, we're, we're doing that in the accelerated process that I talked about, laboratory in place on there. So it means decision can be made. It means the drillers don't have to leave for analytical <clears throat> results and then come back and do it faster. Eagle has been uh, very, worked with us very well on that to get it all done. And so we're, we're pushing, we're working it, and I think that, that you, we've seen the full support throughout the Department of Defense that we're on the right track to get it done. Circle process is complex. It is methodical, but it's done to assure that there is protection of the public health and the environment at the end of the day. And that means it's it's done carefully. It's done there so that we don't overlook anything, whether that's collecting the samples, looking at all the various remedial actions that are possible and get it done so that at the end of the day, the right decisions have been made in collaboration with regulators and other involved public input and everything else. That's the bottom line, and uh, so we'll get there. Uh, Dr. Termath, we have a follow-up question from Keith Matheny with Detroit Free Press. Is lake foam contaminated with PFAS compounds on Van Etten Lake and or the Osable River being addressed in any of the actions under consideration now? If not, why not? Or when will it be addressed? In terms of the foam, I know that Eagle has done, uh, has been doing studies to try and figure out because the foam is not just unique to Wordsmith, and they've been looking at that, and they haven't uh, uh, come up with a definitive solution on that. But the important part of that is, is that as we do the cleanup process, that that we'll see reductions in uh, the PFOS, PFOA, and those reductions. Um, hopefully will also reduce the chance of there being foam. But it's a complex situation that has to do with accumulation of, of PFOS, PFOA on that molecular surface layer up there that causes the problem and not the uh, direct concentration all the time in the lake. Uh, sorry, it wasn't a straight answer on, on what it is, but it's, it's not known right now what all can be done to immediately reduce that, that foam. Okay, thank you, Dr. Termath. Uh, we're going to go to Garrett Ellison for the final question of the day. Garrett? Thanks. Um, Dr. Termath, uh, I was actually up in Oscoda this week, and I stopped by Cedar Lake, um, which is um, you know, north of the bay. And there's foam on Cedar Lake at the end of uh, Fox Drive. I have some pictures of it. And I was wondering, you know, does the Air Force have any idea what could be causing it up there, right? At some of these other uh, locations, um, you know, that I, is there a mutual aid response uh, history up there? Is there, does the Air Force know of some other potential, um, you know, source? Um, you know, I believe I've heard that the Air Force does not consider it to be itself to be responsible for that, but Nonetheless, it's not just Van Etten Lake. I have evidence of foam on Cedar Lake as well. So I'd like to know if you guys are aware of the issue on Cedar Lake 
um, and if you have any insight into it. No, not aware of the issues on Cedar Lake, other than the fact that there is also naturally occurring foam, and then there's the foam where you have the naturally occurring mixed with uh, with PFOS. I've seen a lot of PFOS foam at this point, and this is definitely PFOS foam. Okay. Well, let me just refer to Cedar Lake. Cedar Lake is uh, up gradient, and flow and uh, water in that area flows towards Van Etten Lake, and would not be related to any Air Force activities, and I'm unaware of any uh, mutual uh, aid activities that occurred up there. So we, we don't have a comment on it and uh, don't know what, what what's causing that. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, uh, thank you for your time today. We are at 11 o'clock or uh, 11 o'clock Central, 12 o'clock your time. Thank you for being here.